Hey guys, what's up? So, two things. One, you probably have noticed that everything's looking smoother right now as far as the video is concerned and you know the fact that the sound is actually properly syncing up with what you're seeing. Yeah, I think I finally got the camera issues ironed out. And it looks like the culprit was the updated freaking software. Yeah, I was suspecting that was what the case was. See, I'm using a Logitech C920. And if you look online for reviews for this thing, you will pretty much see favorable reviews. Everyone's talking about, oh, it's a fantastic webcam. It's one of the best HD webcams there is. I mean, they've updated it fairly recently to a better version, which I was tempted to get my hands on after the issues I was suffering from this recently. But yeah, like even when it first came out, everyone was like, oh, this is great. It's great. It's awesome. It's fantastic. It's this, is that, that, and this. But what the reviews don't bother telling you, and it's the user reviews you got to look at, is the, the people who got their hands on the cameras notice that there's some freaking lag issues with this. Excuse the beeping. That's my oven. There's some lag issues with this camera. And it's weird that I thought that it was it was processor based. Like I thought that they're like, okay, if you get a better processor, the lag issues will go away. No. No, it's 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 pretty much just the camera. And in order to solve them, at least when you first got your hands on this thing, you pretty much had to turn all the auto features off. Everything off. Like the auto lighting, contrast, focus, just turn all that stuff off. And however you want it set, you got to set that manually and hope that what you've done to set it doesn't interfere too much with the record. Like you want this to be bare bones recording, which means that you better hope the lighting around you is really good because it's not going to auto correct for that or because you got to turn all that stuff off. And you have to make sure that when you're recording, the format it records in is not compressed. It has to be straight up raw recording. Because if you do anything that compresses the, you know, actual file, if you have anything auto running in the background that's going to be adjusting the image in any way, you're going to get lag. That's it, it. No matter what processor you're running, no matter how good your computer is, that's just the issue. So for a while, when I was using this camera, I just had everything turned off and everything was fairly smooth. Up until I built this new machine a while back, and when I was reinstalling the software, I noticed that Logitech had updated their, you know, video suite, the, the recording suite, and that new software sucks. It may look pretty, it looks nicer than the older stuff, but it sucks. And try as I might, I couldn't find the older version. I and I just thought, okay, maybe I just haven't figured out exactly how to set up this newer version. Like I tried to turn all the auto stuff off and try to tweak things here there. There was always something wrong. And if you saw the live stream, you know that there was something wrong. And then finally, one particular night when I was trying to record something, I just, I, I lost it, searched online for a solution, and found that there actually is a copy of the old software out there. Deleted the new stuff, put in the old stuff, and lo and behold, everything works properly again. So, yeah, hopefully we shouldn't be having any more issues with this camera, at least until I get a better one. And in the meantime, Logitech, what the fuck? Anyway, enough of that. That's issue number one. Number two. This showed up in the mail. It's time for another unboxing. I think at this point you can guess who it's from because they're the only ones who sponsor me. Thank you very much for you know sending me these pieces. I must stress that I don't ask for these. I don't. Uh, they, you know, I. I guess because we, you know, have had, and again, who I'm talking about is LKHN, LKHN Swords. Ever since my first review of their Flying Phoenix way back, I, you know, been in correspondence with them and their contact, you know, talk sword history, the development of their weapons. I give them feedback on what they could do to improve things. They give me feedback on what they're trying to make. And ever since then, we've just had a decent relationship where I just get stuff in the mail i don't know when they're coming that's the thing like i saw about like two nights ago i suddenly see my email okay you're getting a package in the mail and i didn't order anything oh it's coming from china oh it's <laughs> you know like it's not like i go hey could you give me this piece because i really like it give it to me now i want free stuff and i don't do that to them in fact i was planning on buying 
um, a sword from them like a couple of months down the line, like about a month or so from now, I was planning on buying another piece from them. Like just straight outright. Like I'm not asking for free stuff, but they're, they're nice enough to send me pieces. And of course I will review them, but I don't know what's in here. I have no clue. I just got an email with a tracking number saying that something was coming my way. And now it's here and we're going to see for the first time, like what's in this box. So let's crack this sucker open. While I pop this one open, you may notice that the last review I did was of the um, Royal Armory Infantry Hanzia, um, Handel, that small little sword. And you may remember that the last unboxing I did was of that sword, but also of the, um, the Gorong. I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. But it was those hook shields, those kind of like almost bucklers with the, the hook and one end and the spike and the other. Like it, it looks like a, it almost looks like one of those like shorter um, Zulu sh shields that they use in stick fighting, but it's not. Um, I am planning on showing off one of those and kind of reviewing it, but also showing how it could be used or like giving an idea of how it could be used. Um, Scalagrim, however, beat me to it. He already has a pretty good video on possible uses for it. The reason why mine is taking so long is one, finding somebody to do the practicing with. Two, having the time to go out there and record stuff. And three, I don't want to use it against a sword because these interesting little devices were made more to use against pole arms. Yes, they can be used against swords as Scholargram has already shown and LK Chen himself on his website has already shown. However, hmm, okay, I think I know what this one is. Um, but however, they were like, they were optimally designed for pole arms. So I'm trying to, you know, and I do have one, I sort of, that I can use, you know, to kind of demonstrate, you know, some basics of like how this thing could be used. So, once I get that going, I'll, you know, hopefully I can finally get that up and then show off what it, you know, like give you an idea of some of the techniques. Though if you want a more complete idea of how it's used, I suggest going to the source, LK Chen on his website, um, on the very page for that particular um, shield, I guess. Um, he actually has a video explaining techniques with it. And he does give a good um, demonstration of it against a spear and an actual, um, or the pole axe. So, yeah, or the dagger. I think I call it a dagger axe or something like that. Anyway, yeah, this is what was in my little styrofoam package. And just from feeling this, I think I know what this is already. I'm pretty sure I know what this is already. This, I am quite certain, is the Double Dragon Sweetle that they are offering on their website, which, if that's the case, and that's that's huge because this is one of their, at least from what I've seen and from how it was described to me, this is one of their more premier swords. You have to realize that the other swords that I have reviewed from them thus far, particularly the Dien, um, with I guess the exception of the um, magnificent um, Chu Dien and the um, Roaring Dragon um, double-handed Dien, uh, th they tend to be utilitarian swords, you know, like they look like and they were designed pretty much to be like the type of swords that, you know, the, your basic soldier would use or your, you know, average swordsman would use. They're not super embellished in any way. Like they don't have a whole lot of bells and whistles on them, which I, I kind of like that design. I like my designs to be simple and elegant and they tend to be, but this particular piece, especially if it's what I think it is, and I'm pretty sure it is what it is because of how it feels in my hand. Like, I'm just, you know, feeling the contours. I'm pretty sure it's the, um, it's their Double Dragon um, Sui Dynasty doll. And that one is based on an actual museum piece um, used by a high-ranking. Yep, yep, that's exactly what this one is. That's exactly what this one is. Yep. Check it out. Nice, huh? I remember when I first saw this, I'm like, wow, that is one impressive piece. And up close now, I mean, of course, I got to get the plastic off, but it's a very impressive piece. Very impressive piece. And I've seen 
images of the actual museum piece, which you can also see on the um, main website. And I've talked to my contact with LK10 about this. So they've given me a bit of history on this particular um, weapon. Um, yeah, it, it, it is, it was a weapon of a high ranking, you know, I believe it might, may have been a king's weapon, but off the top of my head, I don't really remember. But I know it was some, it, this is definitely not like, you know, some infantry soldier's weapon or like some common fighter's one. And not only that, but this one also has a bit of Persian influence as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, people are sometimes surprised to hear that China didn't just influence other people's weapons in martial arts. There were also outside influences coming in. And you can see some of them with the design of this sword, particularly the way the handguard is designed and the shape of the sword hanger here, that kind of sort of P shape, I guess, for lack of a better term. It's really nice. You know, already I've noticed the kind of really, I, it's funny, on the, on the website, I thought this handle was a lot thicker and wider than it actually is, which I thought was, gonna, I thought, oh, this thing's going to be kind of wide and it's going to be, eh. like, um, for instance, um, when I visited Scalagram in Canada, that Tai Chi bow that he had that I tried out, which has a pretty good blade, by the way, pretty good balance and a pretty good blade, but that thing was like a beefy sword in terms of how its dimensions and the handle, as you can see, I was able to hold it in two hands, which typically the design doesn't isn't made for two hands, but that one was. And I remember the handle while it had a good shape to it, kind of like that oval geometry kind of shape, you know, so you got good edge alignment. It was wide, like that handle was fairly wide. I'm like, this is kind of a beefy sword. Not necessarily weight, but you know, just the dimensions. This is much narrower. And I think I prefer that. I mean, it's not like I have tiny hands, but you know, I'm not pulling a Trumpism here, but it's it's more like I, I don't necessarily need things to be overly huge because then you want some purchase on it. You don't want the handle to be too thin because then it's, you know, it's hard to grip it, but you don't want it to be too wide because then you're like, Shit. so yeah, I do. Ooh. Nice. I, I, something like this is like, to me, that that's perfect. I, I like this. I like this a lot. It's, it's just right for my hands. It's just right for a good purchase on the blade. And also like for people with um, smaller hands, um, they shouldn't have a problem gripping this. Now, somebody with beefier hands, I don't know. They might consider this one to be a little bit too small, but, you know, your mileage may vary with certain swords. Yeah, trying to get this off. Okay, I gotta clean all this up. So that's the stuff without the all the plastic and crap. And now we can take a decent look at this. I'm already impressed with the detail on the ring at the end. This is when they started decorating the, the rings at the end of their doll. And this yeah, I really liked it, that whole, you know, that double dragon motif. Apparently, and I just recently was told this by um, my correspondent with the company, there were, um, there were certain specifications on what you could put on the ring during this time, like certain animal motifs. And depending on your rank, you know, within, you know, the kingdom, uh, depending on your status, depending on what you could put on here. So having two dragons meant that you were pretty high up, like if not way in the top. Like if you were a low ranking officer or something, you definitely couldn't have this on your sword. So it's like, it was a way of denoting rank and a way of instantly letting somebody know who sees it, like how important you were. So and it's interesting to me how you got all this intricate detail here. And again, this is based on a real sword, like the real museum piece. And I can tell you from what I remember, this is fairly spot, this is pretty spot on. And it's interesting to me that you get all this detail work here. And then once you get here, while there's still some decent detail on the handguard and on the, um, you know, basically the pegs to keep the blade in place in there, 
it, it, they're a lot more simple. So you got kind of like a mix of utilitarian with, you know, embellished. Like it's embellished just enough to let you know that this is a sort of someone of some importance. But at the same time, it's utilitarian enough to let you realize that this is not a ceremonial sword. This thing was meant to be used. And, ooh, well, that's nice. I'm not just talking about the blade, which, of course, it is. The, the, the feel and balance on this. Oh. Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that a lot. This feels a lot like the gen that I get from LK10. That same, that same light, but at the same time, it wants to be used. It has just enough presence in the blade where it wants to go somewhere, but it's not weighing you down. You're not like, I can do this and not feel a strain here in my wrist. This is not overly heavy. This is still a nice weight and a pretty decent balance. But yeah, this thing is, this was meant to be used. This was definitely meant to be used. Also, apparently, yeah, I got more confirmation on the blade geometry here. Remember my, um, the Tong Dao that um, Skull had gifted me way back when that got stolen? Anyway, remember the, how the blade geometry there, you know, had that kind of similar chisel grind kind of set up? I always suspected it was made that way be, to go through armor. And I remember somebody telling me that. And this has that same design. And my contact told me right off the bat, yeah, that this is made more for dealing with heavier targets, heavier armor. Um, when you're dealing with the grind that you see on the den or earlier ago, that smoother, you know, that, that having the edge pulled back further, you know, having the um, the edge bevel pulled back further is more for cutting through, not necessarily super soft targets, but cutting through armor that's not as heavy or not as thick. This was definitely made for going through a target that's made to withstand, you know, edge blows better. So like, this is kind of like, you know, like this was made to go through heavier armor, which makes sense considering that this is a later, oh, this is a later sword. Um, than the earlier ones and they're dealing with better defensive technology so they're upping their offensive technology this also is kind of i'm starting to see also with each reproduction and with the research i'm doing and i still owe you guys a video on the you know how jen and doll have developed over the years i'm seeing now the evolution of like how the weapons start getting heavier and shorter over time in terms of like on the, the you know on the battlefield because the one thing that kind of perplexed me is in the earlier days you see gen that are you know really long even the one-handers really long and then by the time you get to the Ming and Qing dynasty they're averaging 28 inches and you're like what the, did they lose you know like what happened here did they forget how to make good swords, you know, with decent steel and keep it long and still keep the resiliency and the, you know, the hardness of the edge? Like, what happened here? And now I'm beginning to realize that it's more of changing with the times. Like, when you're dealing with earlier armor, you know, that's not necessarily as thick and heavy as what they're going to be using later on, you can kind of get away with a lighter sword. And you definitely want that length because the longer your weapon, the better your reach, the more, but, you know increases your lethality against that that's the reason why the spear is so potent on the battlefield against you know something like this but then as time goes on and they're wearing heavier armor you start needing to change it first you're changing the blade geometry but later on you need to get change the mass you need to make your blades a little bit heavier so they can really get through the target like and really you know get through there and that means like if you're going to be having them this long but increasing the mass that's a little too much strain for the average soldier, you know, to deal with in a long fight. So you're sort of forced to have to make them shorter, you know, like with all that steel that you're using. And the blades, I've noticed, get wider as well. Again, it seems to facilitate the cut. Not only do we see this with Dao, but we're seeing this with Dian over time. Until we reach, you know, the end of the Qing Dynasty and into the Republican era, where martial arts are no longer you know used like especially like cold weapon martial arts are no longer the main thing used on the battlefield and now the reason why we're seeing them light 
is because they're not training with weapons that were made for the battlefield. And this is, and then of course with them forgetting or losing knowledge of you know real swordsmanship over time, then the myths start popping up, and that's a whole can of worms. And yeah, there's probably somebody watching this video right now, and I, I know who you are. You already have a very strong opinion on the degradation of Chinese sword arts these days. Like this dude is seriously. I would love to have an interview with him. He is seriously ready to give up <laughs> on reconstructing sorts. Of He's that much of a pessimist, and I can't blame him. But I'm going way off target. What's off topic? We're talking about this. My first impression of this, and I like this a lot. I like this a lot. This is now. Granted, I'm thinking another reason why I'm liking it so much because you know it's thin, it's light, it's elegant, but it's also still, despite the fact that this is a doll, I can still employ this. Like a Dien. I still want to use this like a Dien. And it's still pretty much balanced like a Dien, you know? Oh, and I almost forgot. Working with that freaking tassel. Okay. This is something that's been bothering me for a long time. And we got this tassel right here, right? Which is purely decorative. For any... Let's just get something out the way right now. And I know there are going to be people in the comment section arguing with me on this, talking about my master told me this, this book says that. Let's get something out the way right now. The tassel on the sword is decorative. It started out as decorative. Hmm, interesting that I can't seem to get this back in so easily. Hmm. Try this again one more time. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Got to be really precise with this because this scabbard, again, I'm not surprised this scabbard was made specifically for this blade, so you got to fit it in just right. Um, ooh, that's not good. Just noticed a crack in here. That must have been from shipping. I'm not surprised. Anyway, like I said, this is purely decorative. Pure decorative. If you look at any surviving pieces, look at any art showing the military guys going off with their weapons, you don't see this. You see this on scholarly swords or on swords hanging on the wall and so on and so forth. You will hear a lot of stuff about how, oh, this was made to distract the enemy. Oh, this was made to like tie to your wrist so that you don't lose it and, and so on and so forth and all that. And I'm not saying that somebody didn't find a use for these. I'm pretty sure people did find a use for these. You see some really inventive uses for these. I'm not saying that that didn't happen, but the primary reason why they were there was for decorative purposes, because let's face it, these started out as weapons for the military. And then later on for straight, even in the civilian circles, they were made for fighting men. Imagine you're trying to train up a militia. Are you going to be spending the extra time to teach them how to use a weapon with this freaking thing dangling around? Or are you just simply going to get rid of it and be done with it like just about every other nation that had swords? I know people are going to disagree with me on it, but facts are facts. Anyway, this piece here, it looks nice. It's pretty. I'm not against a tassel. I just wish it wasn't where it was. I would prefer this over here because, I mean, granted, to be perfectly honest, if I'm going to be using this for practice, which I'm thinking more and more I will, this is coming off. But if I was to keep it on, I'd prefer it there because having it here, it's easier for it to get in your way and it you know, gets caught in here and wrapped around here. You know, I could just, I guess, do that and then keep that from happening. But... If it's at the very end, I find it a bit easier to control. Uh, one other thing that I'm noting that it wasn't as drastic as I thought it would be. When I saw this on the website, I noticed that there was a big contrast between the handle and the scabbard. Like the wood used for the scabbard was much brighter than the handle. And I'm pretty sure it's because they painted the handle, you know, or they like... At the very least, put like, some light resin on the handle and made it much darker. It looked dark blue on the website and on the videos. And I was like, I'm not, I didn't like that contrast. I thought like, you know, that weird kind of dark blue with that weird sort of really light, almost yellowish 
but at least it looked like that to me with a much brighter color on the wood. I'm like, that's way too much of a contrast. And I was thinking the first thing I would ever do if I ever owned one was paint it a similar color. But now that I'm seeing this, and I'm seeing that this is not as dark as I thought, and this one's not as light as I thought, I can actually live with this. This is not, this. it's, it's more balanced to me, the tones. And I'm not seeing it as too drastic a change from the color of the handle to the color of the scabbard at all. One thing I could say right off the bat, the fittings are, aren't loose. They're not sliding off at all, and it doesn't seem like they are going to be coming off. This is much tighter. And considering this was a later sort in their life, they were already selling these. This is not a prototype. Good on you, LK Chen Swords. Good on you. Good on you. <laughs> Good on you with that, too. That's a nice, tight fit. I'm not seeing any gaps whatsoever with the blade in the handle. Good on you. Um, many times, I see, because this is a slightly recessed handguard. Let me see if you guys can see that. If you look very closely here, you can see just about that there's a lead, it's a bit recessed. The blade's a little bit recessed in there. And the scabbard goes just a little bit in that. And sometimes when I look in there with other companies, you'll see a gap in the wood. And you can see they tried their best to epoxy the hell out of it to make up for that gap. Nope, this is a nice tight fit. Nice tight fit. The collar on the blade, nice tight fit. Well, oiled as usual, LKHN never sends a blade that's not properly oiled. The pattern, of course, is gorgeous. I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm trying my best to let you guys see the patterns on these. But that is gorgeous. Oh, man. Once again, fantastic work from the man they call Uncle Hing, who is their uh, made bladesmith. I really like that distal taper there. The, pro the profile taper and the distal taper is nice and graceful. No bends or crooks in the blade whatsoever. Everything is, none of the fittings are wiggling that. If you hear any rattling, it's because of this, that, that thing there. Wow. Mm. Oh, I can't wait to try cutting with this. It's, I know it's going to be a little bit harder to cut with this because of that edge geometry, but I can get it done, and I will get it done. Hell, I might try something new with the cutting as well. So instead of just simple bottles, then there's something I want to try that's a bit heavier. This is nice. And I can easily see this being used on horseback because apparently that's what this sword was for. This was more of a cavalry weapon. And I can easily see that. You know, this is nice. This is really nice. Really, really nice. I also, I could see this handguard for Dien as well. I don't know if they'll ever do it. Because, because again, LK10, they're not interested in making fantasy swords, quote unquote. Like, they're not making, well, if I was a swordsmith back then, this is the design I'd come up with. Like, they're not interested in that. He's interested in, like, look, what were the swords that they used back then and what did they look like? They looked like this. Do we got some museum pieces? Can we get some um specifications on the like what's the length what's the weight okay we got all that okay then we're making that like that they're interested in making affordable but quality reproductions which is why i like them so much so but at the same time there's that one part of me that likes it would be cool to have a sword yeah they generally made the way they were made then but with this hand guard or this particular design it wouldn't fall out of place like they're like no they're not interested in that they're like, look this is what was used back then? Let's find some freaking, you know, museum pieces or find some antiques or find some paintings that are close to the real thing and make that. I can't fault them for that. And they've successfully pulled it off of this as well. They really have. So, yeah, I mean, it looks like I've already done... I'm, I, this is my first impression. This is not a review, even though I've said a lot already. But, yeah, I do... I'm, obviously, I'm going to be doing a proper review for this. And so far, I, I, I like it. I like it a lot. And I, I'm i also just really liking the fact that not only is it a well-made piece, and it's, once again, part of the course of LKHN. It feels great in the hand. The balance is great and all that. The weight is pretty good. But the, nothing's rattling. Nothing's coming loose. Everything, and then there's nothing's crooked. And again, they don't really make things that are crooked. The detail, this is a nice piece. 
It's just a nice piece. It really is. I'm going to have to like trade notes with Scott because I know he has this one as well. I need to get in touch with him. I need to get in touch with him. Period. Um, it's not like we haven't been communicating. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I want to like, like trade notes with him, see what he says and like see what he thinks compared to what I think so far. You know, just to get an impression. Um, and also like feel free those of you who um, have already, because a couple of you guys have private messaged me and told me that you guys have gotten a couple of pieces. And it, feel free to let me know your own impressions of whatever pieces you've ever gotten from. Tell me what you think or any other companies you can think of that are actually pretty good when it comes to, you know, Chinese weapons. And tell me what you think. You know, I'd like to have a forum because, there's, you know, people got plenty of opinions on different Japanese sword makers and European sword makers and good on them on that. Um, but I would also like to see places where we can like discuss our opinions on the modern takes on these particular swords as well. And like, so, so far, what are your impressions if you've dealt with this company? Like, what have you seen that you've liked or disliked or whatever? So, all right, enough yapping. This actually went on much longer than I planned it to be. But yeah, that's my first impressions of this. And so far, I like what I see. There is one big problem, but it's not their fault. Freaking post office. Anyway, yeah, enough of that. I got another video I need to record. So, and also I gotta hurry up and cook. So, catch you guys later.